J.D. Farag on YouTube, a pastor, was saying something that really struck me. He said, if we knew that Jesus Christ, without a shadow of a doubt, was coming back in four or five days, would we be doing anything differently? And then I was rereading something that really motivates me, and that's Revelation 3, to the church at Sardis. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which are about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. Remember therefore what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. If therefore you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come upon you. As if it means that if we were awake, maybe we would know the hour that Jesus is coming. Just a thought. So, I know there are a lot of Christians who are thinking that it could be this September, and there's a lot of reasons why. And I'm thinking, well, it could be very possible. So, this is like a last-ditch effort for me to reach out to anyone that's maybe open still in this country to want to hear the gospel message and to know about forgiveness. So, I am showing two paintings. This is an unborn child of 10 weeks and this one is of 15 weeks. And I painted them large because, for one thing, we have a tendency, if you've ever noticed, being our size, that anything little has not too much of uh, value. For instance, like in the kitchen, if I see a little ant walking by, ding, 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 I'll just go without hesitation, without thought, without feeling shame or guilt. I'll just go, ding, 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 and it's done. I feel no remorse. Why? Well, because it was little. But if we were to magnify it, the size, we would be marveling, not at its beauty, I don't think so, but we would be marveling at the complication of it, wouldn't we? And yet, we will take an unborn child and think it's worthless. And so we go right ahead and we have this silent holocaust of 50 million in this country alone. Well, I would like to wave the red flag or white flag? I guess the white flag. Um, and say, I am sad to report that I had an abortion when I was 16. And I'll try to make this quick. It was before Roe versus Wade. My mother and I flew up to New York City because for some reason it was legal there. And what I vaguely remember is I think a big black limousine who picked a lot of us up and then what I do remember is being lying down in like sardines and being rolled one by one into the uh, you know chamber of horrors and uh, I was waiting my turn and the girl right next to me we were talking and she ended up telling me that this was her fifth time up until that point, I was somewhat okay, but that's when I lost it. And I was wailing, I guess, so much so that my mother suddenly was by my side because the nurse had apparently told her to calm me down. And my mother just innocently said, what's the matter? And I don't think I answered her because, in my opinion, what is the matter? There was a lot the matter. Uh, you know, I wasn't a real brilliant uh, student in high school, but I could put two and two together. What I did not have a, some scientific discussion as to what was happening in my womb, but I can tell you that I knew something was growing. And if, it's, if something is growing, then that means something is alive, right? Something is alive. And so what am I doing there? I am stopping a life to grow. And that means if I hadn't stopped it, it would be born and it would live and have a life. So, you know, I am not a rocket scientist, but I do see that I was part of an evil deed. 
And you know, Planned Parenthood has been exposed these past couple weeks for, which is really wonderful, of a film of their higher ups selling body parts to who knows who. And we're in an uproar about that. And that's really good. But my question is, why aren't we already up in an uproar, you know, that we're doing this in the first place? That we're killing these unborn children. Yes, I am for saving the orca whale, okay? But why aren't we for saving the unborn child? So, I painted these paintings to make them large, to make, well, part of my therapy of healing. I am no longer hiding in the closet with shame. I am coming out, and it's a good thing that I'm coming out on this issue, and I wish more people in the church would come out of the closet of their sins. Uh, maybe then more people wouldn't see us as so self-righteous and, you know, pompous, as some people have told me recently. And, you know, I'm not trying to be pompous. I am trying to say what God says about wrongdoing. I'm not the judge. He is. I'm just trying to pass the message on. And I'm a beneficiary of someone named Goo who told me the gospel when I was 16. Oh, well, actually, years later, I knew her as a 16-year-old. And then, thank God, a few years later, when I was suicidal, she came and told me about the gift of Jesus Christ, blood on the cross, shed for my sins. Now, Honestly, I, at that point, wasn't too concerned about being forgiven for my sins. But I really needed a guide. I had made a mess of my life. And I certainly was sick and tired of trying to trust other people. And, you know, guys. And I, of course, was no one to be trusted either. So it was like the world was a mess and I was a part of it. And so here is someone who's telling me something coherent. And so I thought, hmm in my very intellectual mind as a college student, I thought, oh, let's think this through now. The uh, proposal is one that we will reflect on. And so in my deep intelligence, I thought, well, guys that I dated that I didn't like, I just said goodbye. And, you know, of course, they, when they didn't like me, they said goodbye. And it just sounds like, well, I could invite this Jesus person, God, in. And if after a while I don't like him, I can say, goodbye. That is how intellectual, darlings, I was at the time. And you know what? The amazing grace is that God took me seriously. Because it was like a light bulb went off. Cha ching When I said that prayer, when I repeated it from a friend, because I didn't know how to pray, and I repeated her prayer, and light came into my mind. And so I know now that I have been born again. So this is the deal. If you think when you die, you're going to have the fighting spirit to fight off those demons in the demonic realm and beat death, you have another thing coming, buddy, because you will not have any strength. And don't think Oh, well, there are no such thing as demons. What in the world do you think those mad scientists are doing over in Geneva, Switzerland, in a huge machine called CERN, C-E-R-N? They blatantly say they are trying to get into another dimension, and there's another realm, and you look on their site. Yeah, just go and look at the film they have representing it, and you see what I would call demonic spirits coming in, okay? So I'm just hopeful that we're raptured out of here, which means caught up. We're caught up out of this place when they finally open that door to the other dimension, as if we don't have enough demons on this planet as it is. No, we got to invite more. Okay, go figure. So, before that happens, I just thought I would play this song, and it's based on Isaiah 49, and 20, and you can click it off. You don't want to listen to this. Um, I'm not professional, but I'm trying. And this is a song I wrote because I was bereaved of my two daughters. If you listen to my first of this series, uh, first video, I talk about that. We've been separated, and you know, God has met me in that bereavement because you know what? 
He knows all about being bereaved. He knows what it's like because he's bereaved of you if you don't know him. Because, you know, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you're not born again. If you're not born again, you don't belong to him. Who do you belong to? You belong to the enemy. And so belonging to him, that means when you die, you don't get to go to heaven. And I'm sorry, I didn't make the rules, okay? You know, if you played Monopoly, you go by the rules, all right? Well, this is the rule book. It's the Bible, and I'm sorry to sound, you know, negative. Oh, don't be so negative. Well, what kind of love would I have if I did not tell you what the real truth was, okay? So, and if you think that maybe this isn't the truth, and you're not basing it on any actual research, let me say something. You're willing to risk eternity on a little whim, a little hope that you have that, oh, well, my God that I created would never send anybody to hell. Yeah, well, the God that you created, have you ever met? Have you ever read anything that he wrote? And by the way, does that God that you never create, that you've never, you know, seen, that you've created, okay, if, did he do anything for you, like give you life and send you his son to die on the cross for your sins? That blood was spilled to cover you so that you can be seen in his sight as perfect? I mean, what a God is that? I don't think your God can compare. So, with all that said, I'm going to try to sing this song. <laughs> And it's a prayer, too. It's a prayer for the children in the world, which we all were at one time. And think back about how you were innocent at some point and wanting to be loved and wanting to do right. Then we grow up and we end up being really creepy. <laughs> so here's a prayer. All right. I'm going to try to be serious. Dear Jesus, for all the children in the world, been neglected, rejected, abused, refused, and maybe that's how you felt. Well, so did I. Abandoned, aborted, tortured, molested, I was molested. Sold into slave traffic, sex traffic, sold as organ donors. Hungry, thirsty, imprisoned, loners, no one to turn to, no one. We cry out to you, Lord. Forgive us. We have mercy on us and the children in the world, who, by the way, I think will be all raptured with the Christians.
Reach out for more lost souls. God bless you.